an astrobiologist and I study life. I'm interested in life here on Earth. And I'm also interested in life out there among the stars, if we can find it. And that's really cool, except the problem is we don't really understand what life is. Hey everybody, you're gonna love this interview with Professor Sarah Walker of the Arizona State University. Sarah is a friend that I met virtually, and she is anything but virtual. She's an incredible thinker in the real world, in the scientific communication space. And you're going to hear an exclusive from Sarah today, an Into the Impossible exclusive, that Sarah's writing a book about her travails and travels in the world of the origins of life. So look for that coming later on in your life and her life, and she'll be back on the show. She assures me when that is out. Uh, today, you're going to learn a massive amount of cool, interesting stuff. Sarah's one of my favorite, favorite thinkers of all time. We talked about so much today, and just a smidgen of the topics we're going to cover today involve the question of what is life? Is that even a good question? What is time? Is that a good question? We even got into things such as the origin of biological systems as relating to the laws of physics, even cosmology. Of course, we had to touch upon intelligent design. I asked her some tough questions about that subject as well as her theory that she's developed along with past guest Lee Cronin, so-called assembly theory. You'll learn about that. What is that? How can we detect the imprimatur of life? perhaps here on Earth, perhaps in distant uh, solar systems, perhaps if they come and visit us through Oumuamua, which we also discussed, Avi Loeb and the efforts to uh, ascertain whether or not the existence of techno signatures in the form of objects that visit us should be pursued further. We talked about that. Charles Darwin, his warm little pond, so much more. Her expertise is unbounded. And uh, it's really a great way to continue our mission, the Into the Impossible podcast. I'm so pleased to reveal that we've been ranked number one in all of natural sciences on iTunes and the Apple podcast ecosystem, number nine in all of science. It's just incredible. I never thought when I started doing this just a couple of years ago that it would lead to such great success. And you, my listeners, viewers, are all part of this success equation. I can't do it without you. So please do share the podcast with your friends, share the audio, share the video. Please subscribe to the video uh, as well because I put in some great B-roll production. My super producer, Stuart Volkow, member of the PGA, not the Professional Golfers uh, Association, but Producers Guild, uh, just adds in a magic pixie dust to each and every video and audio episode. So that's Dr. Brian Keating on YouTube. And uh, so today's episode is not one to be missed. I'll talk to you at the end and give you some homework assignments. Stay tuned and now enjoy this episode with Dr. Sarah Walker of the Arizona State University. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. All right, everybody, you are in for a treat on today's episode of the Into the Impossible podcast with a phenomenal thinker, a brainiac, a deep thinker, a uh, astrobiologist, professor, theoretical physicist. She does it all and she does it all incredibly well. I've been a huge fan of hers for a long time and I'm just so happy that Professor Sarah Walker is joining us on the podcast today. Uh, Sarah, how are you today all the way in Arizona? I'm great, how are you? I'm doing well. Uh, so a quick intro, Professor Sarah Walker is an astrobiologist and theoretical physicist interested in the origin of life and how to find life on other worlds. And uh, she is the deputy director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts and Science, associate director of the ASU Santa Fe Institute Center for Biosocial Complex Systems, and assistant professor in the School of uh, Earth and Space Exploration. And that is CC, although I see some conflicting things that your associate professor, someplace I see your assistant professor, it doesn't really matter once you get tenure. And if you don't have tenure, uh, you'll get it. And we would you know, snatch you up in a second if we had a chance here in San Diego. Um, she does a lot of outreach, especially as I met her on Clubhouse, uh, where I've met a lot of people in virtual space, but not in real space. And she's prolific um, uh, engager of the public with scientific concepts, never dumbing things down, having multiple appearances at the World Science Festival, through the wormhole, NPR Science Friday. She does it all. And Sarah, so glad to have you here. Great to be here. I'm looking forward to it. 
Yeah, so we have a lot of um, uh, interesting feedback from my audience, and we'll get to those later. Uh, I always take the host prerogative when my guests are uh, prolific authors, and I ask them, you know, explain uh, the title and origin and judgment of your cover. So I had that with Paul Davies in the interview we put out recently, judging books by their covers. You don't have a book yet, although I'm sure there'll be many publishers dying uh, to get your scrib scrivenings and into uh, the public's hand in a book. And if not, let me be your agent. I will only charge 55%. Um, yeah. But I want to judge your paper, the paper that caught my attention uh, so long ago now, for almost four years ago, Origins of Life, A Problem for Physics. I had the question mark. Sarah, what was the uh, what is the relevance of the origin of life to physics? I mean, uh, I can see for biophysics, but why is or uh, it a problem for physics as a whole? Yeah. So, well, I think people confuse physics with the problems it studied in the past, rather than a way of thinking about the world. So the the issue I see there is that because we've come to kind of a deep fundamental understanding about parts of reality those are confused with physics as a discipline rather than thinking about this idea that physics is really predicated on trying to look for deeper abstract principles that are really explanatory and have a large breadth of explanation. And so with the origins of life, I think that's really critically important because I find it hard to believe that life doesn't have some deep fundamental explanation. Um, and in particular, in the field of astrobiology, when we're talking about whether there's other life out there in the universe, we really need universal principles. And therefore, when you cast it in that kind of framing, it becomes a problem for the mindset of a physicist as far as how do I abstract this problem to its essence? And then how do I develop a mathematical understanding that allows me to predict features of examples of the system that I've never encountered? Um, and I think that's actually really the program for astrobiology is we don't want to just, you know, have aliens hit us in the head or something. We want to actually go out in the universe and look for them and predict where we should find them. And the some of the research I've seen you involved in particular in the paper is kind of straddling the interface between information and complexity as well as uh, life proper, you know, life qua life. And I wonder, you know, I, I don't want to have this, con I don't want to ask you this question, even though people like Lee Cronin told me to ask you this question. Um, I kind of get sick of, uh, of, of me asking it, although I'd love to hear your response if you like, but it's the famous question posed but not answered by Schrodinger, what is life? And I just find it um, a little bit, you know, it's like Wonder Bread or, or something like that. Uh, you know, it's, it's yes, it's technically a, a question, but is it a good question? Maybe we can ask that instead of you defining for the nth time as you've done so skillfully. Um, is, it, is it a proper question or is it sort of like these why questions? You know, why is there life? You know, is it is a different question than what is life? So what do you make of it? Well, so first off, I'm not, I'm a physicist that's not afraid of asking why questions, which is maybe why I ask a traditionally non, or a non-traditional question in physics, um, is that I, I don't think that we should be scared of those questions, because I think by the practice of asking a why question, you ask things differently than if you didn't consider the why, which means your what questions are better informed, um, because they have some deeper principles underlying them. The what is life question, I think, is ill-posed because it makes some assumptions about um, life as we understand it being a natural kind or being actually a category in nature. And usually when, at least if you look at the history of physics, it's not like we were asking what is gravity before we came up with the idea of gravity. We were asking other questions like, why do the planets have regular motion in the night sky? Or why does this apple fall from the tree the way it does? Or why does this, you know ball roll down this inclined plane. Um, and then we came up with this kind of unifying explanation that we call the laws of motion and the laws of gravitation. And I think when we're approaching the life question, there's a lot of assumptions that because we are life, uh, we know what life is. Um, and therefore, we can just go in and define it. And what is life actually makes sense as a question. But I think as you dig down deeper into that question, it starts to make less sense to pose it that way. So the way that I like to think about the question is, what are the laws of physics that would have features associated to them that explain the phenomena that we call life? Um, and that's a little bit of a mouthful, but I think what, what the simple way of saying it is there's something underneath the phenomena we call life that's probably a pretty deep explanation. Um, and we should really be trying to derive the properties of life, not define them. 
Right. And I think maybe we could we can even start there by um, you know, recapitulating some of the notions of of emergence, which which you've spoken about before, but I think my audience would would get a kick out of hearing it from you. I, I always say, you know, life is kind of like the uh, Supreme Court's, you know, nineteen fifty something definition of, of pornography. It's like we know it when we see it. Uh, and we but maybe we know it when we don't or we know what it is when we don't see it, you know, uh, more, more likely. But but I wonder the confluence of information and life as an emergent phenomena and the concomitant, you know, question of how does consciousness emerge? Uh, a lot of people maybe conflate, maybe erroneously, I don't know, I'm not an expert like you are, but consciousness as being a prerequisite to understand life. In other words, can you have life without consciousness? Uh, certainly there wasn't maybe conscious life uh, before, you know, human beings maybe or something like human beings. Um, and yet there was life. So I, I, can you talk about this emergence? And as Morrison said, you know, more is different. And so, uh, first of all, what is emergence and why is it why is it relevant potentially to the origin of life? Yeah, so um, emergence is this idea that you can get new properties at new scales of organization. So like if you think about, you know, reality being separated out in scales, which it's really not, it's just that we do that because we have to build models of things. Um, you know, there's the atomic scale and then atoms come together to make molecules. And then maybe when you're talking about living things, you get cells and cells come together to make multicellular organisms or people come together to make societies. And when we're looking at each of those different spatial scales, uh, we see um, fundamentally new rules emerging. And so this is one of the reasons that Anderson said more is different. It's not the same at every scale. We actually see new properties. And one of the things that's probably the most mysterious about emergence is it seems to be the case that you can describe these scales independently of having to refer back down to the lower level scales. So a lot of, so for example, we can talk about social dynamics without having to appeal to say QCD or something, right? So we don't need to have those theories of like how the very basic component parts work to understand something at a high level like that. Um, and so uh, in sort of our traditional concepts of science, that seems kind of deeply mysterious because people think, or well, there seems to be some conflict um, as far as, well, well, are these genuinely new properties um, or, is it the case that if we really had a giant supercomputer and we could run, say, the um, interactions of all the elementary particles in a social system, we'd actually really recover those high-level dynamics? Um, and of course, this gets into more issues of, um, like, let's say maybe um, something like metabolism. You know, like I'm eating. Is there a particle description of what it is for me to be eating? Um, but then there's also the question: Is there a particle description of what it is for me to feel hungry? Because um, feeling hungry, hungry seems much more subjective and intrinsic to the scale of organization that I operate on. So there's some questions in biology that seem much more apparent that some kind of emergent um, description is actually necessary. You can't really reduce it to the particle description. And it's interesting because in this paper you talk about, you know, kind of the emergence of life, but the first example that you give and, you know, and the history of life's, uh, of life's emergent properties of life is a colony or these stromatolites, which, yeah. um, you know, seem to be these mysterious uh, things in, in, in Australia um, that uh, are collectives. It's not like we find some isolated, you know, protozoa somewhere by itself, at least as the earliest form of life, if, if I'm not mistaken. And so it seems, yeah, again, even kind of cut it, you know, breaking the egg even more, the chicken or the egg. Now it's like, which comes first, the collective or the, you know, individual in order to have a definition of life. And, you know. Yeah. I, well, I think, I think, again, that's not the right framing of the question because the issue is that you're looking at it as two scales, <laughs> but really the phenomena itself is a multi-scale phenomena. So people think, you know, life emerged at, at, at like a cell scale or something and cells, you know, reproduced and then radiated out across the planet. But really, um, you know, there's other theories of the origin of life that it was, um, you know, like biochemistry emerged from geochemical cycles. And then you start thinking about it more in terms of ecosystem scale or planetary scale. And so I think this idea, this very, it's a very reduction idea that we think life is about individuals and it's not actually about individuals um, at all it's about um, information propagating along lineages so a cell even if you think about a cell as a structure as an individual a cell has to constantly rebuild itself and it's using the information imprinted in the matter that it is to reconstruct itself and then if you think about that extended over time the structure that you call life is actually 
this structure that's extended out over time, basically the pattern that keeps reproducing itself in, in the material substrate. Um, so a lot of the discussions I have with colleagues, um, and in particular this idea comes from Michael Lachman at Santa Fe Institute, is really to think about the fundamental unit of life as a lineage of information. And we're all just these kind of bundles of intersecting information, if you think about evolution. And I think this is really related to the problems associated to emergence. So just to, because I think people have removed time from consideration in the way we talk about both physics, because time is supposed to be an emergent property, right? Time doesn't exist at the fundamental scale. It has to emerge based on some properties of the second law or, you know, there's all these arrows of time we talk about, like the cosmological arrow of time, the second law, the biological arrow of time, why is biology increasing? And they all tend to point in the same direction. And that's some big mystery in current physics because there's no fundamental concept of time. Um, but in biology, if you put time as being uh, more primary, I think it actually takes care of some of the issues of emergence. Because when you're talking about an object that has emergent properties, what you're really saying is that object has more time in it, um, where time is actually a physical attribute of the object. And this is something uh, that we're trying to do in assembly theory because you think about like a molecule as being all the ways of assembling a molecule, which is basically looking at the structure across time. Um, and so then you can stack, you know, that whole hierarchy I did of, you know, going from atoms to molecules to cells to multicellular things to societies as actually being about how much time exists in an object. Um, and that brings in sort of the idea that evolution, sorry, my light went out, um, <laughs> um, actually is sort of fundamental to the way that we talk about uh, what life is in the sense that time actually has to be a part of the way you construct theories, that you actually think things exist across time. They're not just an individual instance that exists at that moment you're observing it. Well, yeah. One of the questions I have about assembly theory is that it, could imply if there's some, you know, end of of the historical deviations from a previous state. Um, you know, let's say we get to the ultimate uh, evolution of society. You know, we we become university professors, and you know, that's the pinnacle of evolution. Yeah, you know what the proof is, by the way, that we have the best job in the world, Sarah. You know what the proof of that is? What? What did the man who achieved the highest heights, literally in history, namely Neil Armstrong, walking on the moon? What did he do? After he retired from walking on the moon, he became a professor. <laughs> I see. So, so let, let's stipulate that's the highest form of evolution. Now, okay. if you then reach kind of a, sta a stasis, you know, I can agree that there's more complexity in a uh, in, in Darwin's warm little pond, which we'll get to, than there is in just water molecules by themselves. So assembly theory would say there's more information, more stored memories, etc. Right. Um, but you know, eventually there comes to some stasis, but time doesn't cease. So how how can you reconcile those two facts? In other words, and without knowing what comes next after societies, um, you know, then then or collectives. Um, that time can then continue to progress in a way that the biological, psychological, cosmological, all the different arrows of time would agree that, yes, time is progressing if you reach some maximum stasis? Um, so I think part of the... This, this is a really interesting question. So one of the things I've been doing a lot of thought experiments on is what does a clock look like in assembly theory? But I, I don't have, like... And Lee and I have been debating about that. But... Um, but I think um, one of the key points is if you think that there's an ordering of events, like I can't spontaneously fluctuate out of the vacuum, which current theories of physics might say could happen, and I, I think is actually a logical impossibility. So, so sometimes, so where, where it gets interesting talking about life is where we have had a tendency in the past to take theories of physics and draw them to like their logical end state and then accept that that's actually a real possibility in our universe, even though it's ludicrous. And then you come at it looking at from the perspective of life and you really see why it's ludicrous. So there's like this idea of Boltzmann brains or anything is possible to flux spontaneously fluctuate into existence. And part of the sort of argument that we would make in assembly theory is, no, that's not possible because you actually need the specific sequence events to make that object. There had to be causal structure in place, things that you might call constructors or however, whatever language you want to use, information in the system to actually assemble that specific object. So you can't just get a Sarah for free. You have to go through the 4 billion years of evolution to get to an object like me. Um, so even if I was static and I never changed in the future, you would still have that four billion year time point. But the but part of the point is also I I have to constantly reassemble myself to exist. So I'm not a static object. I'm I'm a, 
a thing that is constantly reconstructing myself, you're constantly reconstructing yourself right now. So even if you're just sitting there and you're not doing anything, your body is metabolizing. I'm like Madonna. I'm always reinventing myself. That's right. (laughs) Material girl. Um, (laughs) I'm also a material girl, but I like Roger Penrose's perspective that he doesn't know what the material is. And um, I think that's probably pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. Um, So, um, so I think um, when you think about it from that perspective, I don't think that the traditional notion that things can be static in time actually even makes sense. Um, And so part of the, the way um, you know, we're playing with ideas is, is this causal structure, if you want to call it ordering in time, is the fundamental thing. And that universe is constantly assembling itself into the next quote unquote state. Although I don't really, even, I, I think states are kind of a weird thing that we talk about in physics for various reasons. But the next thing that exists. Um, so, so the universe is constantly moving forward in time, but it exists in the current moment, right? So it's that assembled moment. So, so there's not really... For things to persist, right? Like, why does something exist across time? Um, it actually becomes an active process, not a static one. Mm-hmm. So, um, I have a question from an audience member named Lee Cronin, and it says, <laughs> "Is Lee right about time?" Now, I I, I don't want to make this about Lee. Lee gets enough attention, and uh, he's no he's very shy. So, you know, it's it's, it's hard it, for us. Yes, we have a question about Lee. He's very shy. Yes. <laughs> um, but I'm curious because we are talking about time. Uh, when we had a conversation uh, a week or two ago, he and I on Kurt J. Mungle's channel, Theory of Everything, which folks should check out. Um, you know, he basically says that you know time doesn't exist, and uh, you know, and 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 because only through you know, ent- only chemists have a have a true proper understanding of entropy, and time is fundamentally a chemical process or entropic process, which relates to the second law. Now, given that there, and I said there's so many different definitions of entropy, and my my friend and and maybe you know Nicole Younger Halpern as well. Yeah, she's great book coming out. She'll yeah. be a guest next month on the podcast cool. uh, for Quantum Steampunk. She talks about. The you know the advice that that von Neumann was was given I think to uh, Szilard or somebody said when you don't know how to define something just call it entropy because nobody knows what entropy is. Right. So um, I like the fact that so far we haven't really referred to entropy um, or the second law, but yeah. I think it is appropriate to get into that and maybe you know my ratings really depend on on drama and battles. And, oh, I see. So, okay. so leap through now, down. Let's tell physics. <laughs> You and I have to speak on behalf of physics, okay? So these chemists are, are doing too much. I call them chemists, by the way. <laughs> oh, really yeah. um, but is it is it a fundamental physical concept? Um, you know, Nicole talks about the the elemental fundamental clock, and that you could have a two state system that's a clock, and and we use you know atomic clocks that are you know not strictly two state systems, but um, could such a model in your theory have have a truly said to be a complex, you know, if you make the simplest instantiation of an object, namely a two-state quantum clock, um, and that exhibits and it can do certain things and has certain properties associated with clock, in what sense could we say that that will continue to exhibit, you know, the features of assembly theory that would lead one in your rubric to account that it has sufficient complexity to be warranted amongst the pantheon of different discussions of entropy, et cetera? Yeah, so so this is very much um, a work in progress. I don't actually know exactly what you're asking because I feel like there were like ten questions in your. Yeah, question. there there were probably more than that. I guess imagine just a simple two state clock. Um, you know, is that is that sufficient to account for time? And people say that time is emergent. Oh, um, you know, but but we all know it again, like pornography. We all know it when we say it. Uh, so you know, a simple clock. How does that fit in in the uh, just a, a yeah, so- this, in a sense? Right. So I, I think this is one of the places that maybe Lee and I disagree, but I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Yeah. Um, because it is like something that we're trying to develop. Right. So, you know, and part of the reason that you want to work with multiple people on developing a theory is where you find congruence in your ideas or when you convince another person, then you start to see that there's some really interesting stuff going on. Um so I think I think one of the the so the one thing I think that we do agree on is that time is moving forward, whatever that is, and that there's and that it's a generative mechanism for the universe. So time is actually the thing that generates the universe. Um, and then I guess when I think about time in an object, I don't think about that linearly, though, right? So when we think about a molecule existing as a you know a certain amount of time or causation exists in the molecule maybe causation is a better word than time you can think about all the ways of assembling the molecule which means that that molecule actually 
has a very complex structure in time. It's not one way that time that, that causation could have a sequence of events to produce that molecule. It's all the ways. Um, and so a simple example that I like to do as a thought experiment is just to think of a stack of Legos. So imagine, you know, I was holding a stack of 10 Legos and maybe like five were yellow and five were blue and they were arranged in a particular pattern. In order to understand the assembly structure of that stack of Legos, I actually have to take the Legos apart into the five blue and five yellow, and then build up the pathways. So the argument I would make is all of those ways of assembling that object are features of that object. But to resolve those features, you actually have to observe them across time because they're not features that exist in any one instant of time. Um, and so, and then if you want to see them in a linear sequence of time, you have to do that over and over again, but they're all features of what could have happened if you wanted to assemble that. So, so time doesn't necessarily have a single strand to it. It's this very complicated causal structure embedded in an object, but the universe as a whole is constantly chugging forward in time. So a clock um, is kind of an interesting object because you, you want to ask, well, how how much complex time is in a clock, or is the clock actually tracking the the motion of the uh, the universe forward in time? And I think those are two different ways of asking questions about the nature of time in a clock. Very good. So um, uh, so I guess we'd say maybe Lee is not quite right, or maybe it's not quite complete. So that'll uh, that'll stimulate him. Why it depends on what it's on, right? So sometimes right. he's clearly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I wonder, you know, if we can, you know, hit some of the classics at, and walk me through the current thinking of it as a, as a cosmologist, I, you know, I'm not nearly as in touch with the, uh, underlying, you know, kind of state of play of things, although it's quite fascinating to me. And, uh, and yet I feel like there hasn't been much progress in some of the actual origin of life uh, in certain, in certain sects there have been, um, you know, extremophiles and, and so forth. But, you know, one of my proofs that there has been some stagnation, uh, in things like string theory is that, you know, string theory is like the best theory ever invented to describe string theory. You know, it, <laughs> it has, it has a lot of, uh, has a lot of promise to describe string theory, but, but can it describe other things? And I think that's what gives something predictive and val uh, value. Now, if you go back to Darwin's paper, I think it was to Huxley. It might have been a letter to Huxley or something. He said, like, you know, if life could begin in some warm little pond with mineral salts and so forth and this thing and that thing and proteins and, and whatever, um, then, you know, it could evolve. In other words, that life could sort of uh, kick off in this warm little pond, which in my simple-minded way of looking at it is not too dissimilar from an experiment done by the namesake of our chemistry department, Harold Urey, and his student Stanley Miller here at UC San Diego. They did it in Chicago, but they were later professors here. Um, and that was this Miller-Urey experiment. And in my mind, we haven't made much progress uh, since those, you know, initial kinds of experiments, which were at least intellectually the heir of the warm little pond thought experiment of Darwin. So can you take us to where, where do things stand, you know, in the kind of replication of life, not the classification, and we moved away from that, but, you know, origin of life, um, you know, for ab initio, uh, and then uh, perhaps, uh, since you said nothing's off limits, we can talk about some of the criticisms, even from the intelligent design community, if you're willing to go there. Yeah, I'm uh, willing so, to go there. I, think, I yeah. think they have some legitimate arguments, but I don't agree with the answer they provide to the argument. Yeah. Um, so but, where are we at with Miller-Urey type experiments? Yeah, so actually, so, so I made a crack that Lee is sometimes wrong, but we all are. But I think the thing that he's really good about is um, pushing the boundaries. And I think something he's really right about is how much intelligent design goes into current original life experiments or historically. And what, what he means by that is when you're designing an experiment, you purify the reagents, you put them in a test tube, you know exactly what's in there, you, you crank a knob for like if you want to, you know, put, change the pH or you do, you know, add a mineral, but it's all very controlled and very methodical. Um, and so basically, the way I think about it is you're putting agency into the system. You're constraining all the boundary conditions. So when you get a complex molecule out, like say you, you do produce um, a molecule that is implicated in life, um, 
is it because that actually is a spontaneous process or is it because you as an agent that already evolved in the universe controlled the boundary conditions so tightly that you basically predispose the system to generating that complex structure? Um, not that we actually make complex things prebiotically because we make really simple biomolecules. Um, but this, this is sort of one of the problems. So if you, buy, if you buy sort of the set of arguments that life is more about the lineage and we're all just kind of these packets of information um, or these features of assembly space that are propagating and generating more structure, um, then anything you do is basically becoming part of that living structure because you're a cause for those kind of things. And so the real challenge of original life experiments is to remove our biological lineage and all the agency that we've accumulated over 4 billion years from the design of experiments. And so this is something that is one of the reasons that I really wanted to start working with Lee when we first started talking is because he was the only person that I felt recognized this issue and the only person that was really trying to design original life experiments that could do this. And one of the ways he's doing that is through this automation, this digitization of chemistry to basically build experiments that are agnostic. They're not designers like we are. Um, and they don't have any predisposition to what the chemistry of life needs to look like. And you basically want to start from a messy soup of things and try to evolve it under all kinds of different um, simulated planetary conditions. I, th I think of it, if we could scale this up, it would be like a planet simulator. And, and Lee and I are working on ideas about how would you actually generate an experiment at scale like you would do in particle physics. So um, my favorite sort of experiment to compare this to is Super Kamiakande, um, which is one of my favorite experiments um, in Japan looking for proton decay. So proton decay has been predicted by theories never observed in our universe. And every time we don't observe that event, we can bound the probability. The problem with the original life is it's a chemical search problem. Chemical space is huge. It's exponentially huge. Um, it's beyond exponentially huge. The combinatorial possibilities of molecules you can get, even for a small number of elements, is just, it, it's larger than you can possibly fathom. So the question is, how would you build a, a experiment long, large enough to simulate planetary chemistry and explore enough of the volume of the space that you would expect a high likelihood for the original life to pop out. And that's the, the kind of way we need to think, um, not as designers of the original life, but asking, how is this a process that happens in the universe and how can we bound the likelihood of it? The longer we don't observe it, the lower probability it is, just like proton decay. And we need a theory to search it, which is what we're trying to do with assembly theory. So if you put those kind of experiments together with something like assembly theory, then you have this kind of way of doing original life science, like the way that we explore the early universe in cosmology or the way we think about particle physics. So one of the things that the you know, characteristic of super K is A, it uses, you know, super, you know, pure uh, reagents, a huge volume. Sometimes they explode the photomultipliers and then grad students have to go on a canoe. We'll put in some background footage of super Kamiya Kanda here. Uh, but I wonder, you know, when you think about uh, the, you know, kind of this, this challenge, it's kind of going the opposite way of Miller-Urey. They literally did it with stuff you got at the chemistry stock room in Urey Hall here at UC San Diego. Uh, you could do it. And, uh, and of course, you know, now we know that it, I mean, it wasn't like fraudulent data, but it, but it was, you know, it was far off from what we now know about the origins. Of, and yet it's still, if you, if you look at many, many, you know, kind of um, uh, proposals of at least in, in secular books, et cetera, and even, you know, popular popularizations, it's always pointed to as, you know, Oh, you got Miller-Urey and, and, you know, some version of it. Well, it didn't exactly do it. But, but we're confident some other, but no, I mean, it's not like we're saying, oh, well, Super Kami Kanda, you know, hasn't seen it and therefore, you know, but we'll have some version of Super, no, all we can do is run it longer, as you say, with a larger fiducial volume. And then with, you make up for time by having more opportunities for decay and then the properties of half-life then work in your favor. But this is kind of going the opposite way of Miller-Urey. Uh, which is to go, you know, instead of looking at one proton decay, you're looking now you, how big an experiment would you need? And, and, and would it be imposing, you know, this, this purity upon it? Or, or would you even be using physical chemicals at all? Or would it be purely simulated? No, it has to be physical, right? Because we don't know, we don't understand what physics governs original life. It's not like you can't simulate life in a computer because you don't understand the causal structure of what life is. Mm -hmm. if, if we had the right physics, we could simulate life in a computer. We can simulate some projections of features of life, like evolutionary mm -hmm. processes and things in a computer. But I think the original life we can't simulate because we don't know the principles. Um, but just on the point about Miller-Urey and comparing to the way the particle physics community works, say, and the way the original life community works. 
when you look at origin of life experiments globally, it's always the case that it's like a single lab, you know, has their favorite molecule that's implicated in life. And they want to understand if they can synthesize that under quote unquote prebiotic conditions, where prebiotic conditions is again, some kind of pure reagents, not necessarily a mix of soup that would be present on the early earth, but some purified chemical compounds that they mix together in precise ratios. And then they, they subject it to whatever kinds of conditions that they want to study the particular synthesis pathway. And of course, that's an okay mentality for doing science if you're an organic chemist and you've been trained to, to synthesize a purified reagent. But a molecule is not life. Um, and producing a single molecule associated with life under those kind of conditions is not solving the origin of life. And then you'll get um, one, you know, lab, you know, maybe making amino acids over here under some kind of condition that might be presumably prebiotic, and another lab over here making a nucleobase, and another lab over here talking about the energy pumps necessary in early membranes. And there is this sort of rampant assumption in the field that some people will, will really precisely articulate. So Nick Lane is one of these people that if we know enough of those steps, we'll be able to just string them together, and then we'll be able to understand the mechanisms of the origin of life. But I think what that view is missing is that each step is precisely tailored to the particular outcome that you want for that step, which means that we are putting um, so much agency into those experiments. I, I like to equate it a little bit to like um, verifying a number is prime. If you want to find the next prime, that's a really hard search algorithm because you don't know what you're looking for. But if you already know it's prime, it's pretty easy to develop algorithms to verify it's prime. And so what prebiotic chemists are doing right now is verifying primes by looking for known molecules and doing it under very controlled conditions. And they ha happen to be small primes because they're not very complicated or hard to get to. And what we really want to do is try to find what's the large, like what's the largest prime and like how can we predict that a priori. It's like a it's a much harder problem for origins of life than as far as a, it's not even the same like class of search problem that we're doing right now as it should be and right and then again, getting back to this kind of controversy which lee said in his interview with me although i've heard him you know take multiple sides of it it's like it's like stephen hawking penrose says you know you always want to make a bet with stephen hawking because no matter what side you take he'll capitulate and you'll always be right because uh, he always changes mind. Uh, now I've heard Lee debate intelligent designers and uh, and have you know some some very harsh upbraiding you know in a gentle gentlemanly Scottish way that he has. Um, but I've also heard him you know say that literally chemistry has an intelligent design problem or biochemistry has an intelligent design problem. You mentioned that you're not uh, afraid. What what do you say to somebody like past guest Stephen C Meyer, um, or you know perhaps future guest I've, I've spoken to James Tour. Uh, you know, who stipulate that, yeah, there are these problems of, you know, purity of very carefully cl controlled initial conditions, as you know, from physics training, uh, you know, this is an incredibly important and vital aspect of characterizing any physical system, let alone a biological system. So, you know, is, is this, uh, you know, destined to, to kind of always have this ambiguity, which drives human beings crazy, not, not being black or white. Um, but you know, th is there a point? Do if you had a steel man or steel woman, the uh, the the points of the ID, the intelligent designers, the Stephen C. Myers, what what would you say? And then and then we can look at you know countering it, uh, for example. What what are the biggest criticisms in this field of origin of life? Um, I think the well. I mean, I think there's a lot of them, but I guess the the main one is just because we don't have a mechanistic understanding doesn't mean that we need to appeal to something outside of the universe. And I'm agnostic on sort of all issues. And I think what I, I always try to do is maintain an open mind that any possible explanation is possible. But I see so many roots to actually having an understanding of the origins of life being something that we can understand from physical principles within the universe. I think the problem is that we're not asking the questions the right way. And even the way we ask the questions is actually loaded the die for intelligent design to be the explanation because the way we talk about the origins of life is wrong. Um, and I, I think we have, we have too many uh, preconceptions about the problem and the nature of what we are and the assumptions that we understand what we are um, that make it really hard to work in this area. And this is one of the reasons that, I mean, I started in when I was a PhD student as a cosmologist, but one of the reasons I really wanted to work on origins of life is because the conceptual foundations were so poorly defined. Um, and on some level, I don't even care if the way that I'm trying to pose the question is right, but what I do with the problem 
And what I do with every problem that I try to look at is look at how people are talking about it and then just try to turn it slightly and be like, there's another logically consistent narrative with all the evidence we have over here that nobody's actually looked at yet. So why don't we explore that one and try to see where the possibility space is for that one? And then that opens up subsequent pathways. And I just think that people haven't really been poking at the original life things from the right angles yet. And and we've seen that through the history of human thought that we've had major breakthroughs as soon as somebody came up with some fresh idea to something. So I think any time that you want to prematurely say a problem is unsolvable is um, really limiting the potential of what humans can do in the future. Um, because I also, <laughs> this is sort of a bias of how I think about constructing theories. Um, and maybe it's a very David Deutschian kind of view, but I really think that explanations are pretty fundamental. I mean, they're fundamental to the physics of what life is. Like the, my favorite kind of physics is uh, the physics of theoretical physicists. Um, so <laughs> talk about, about going back to like the pinnacle of like, you know, that's like a really egotistical way to study life. But of course, it's the example of life I'm most intimately familiar with. And also like cognitively, when I do thought experiments about life, it's the one that I have the most playroom with. But the, but it's also like a carefully constructed set of experiments because mathematical physics has done so well, this idea of taking abstractions, mathematical objects, and using them to describe reality, and then doing incredible things with those descriptions of reality, like launching satellites into space based on the laws of gravitation, or building experiments like Superconi Akande to look for the decay of the proton, or discovering gravitational waves, which have been passing through the Earth as long as life has been on this planet, but we've never made contact with that phenomenon in the universe before. We actually knew to go look for it. So I think um, I think the idea that we won't have a theory that explains us is, to me, incredibly limiting about the future potential of our planet and where we're going. Because right. if we do understand what we are, then we have control over that phenomenon in the same way that we have an understanding of gravity and can control motion and understand how to launch rockets and things. Imagine what it would be like if we understood what life was. Right. Yeah. I would say, you know, two things. One, you know, these pro nature's under no obligation to make things understandable to you on the timescale of a PhD thesis uh, or a tenure case. Uh, but um, but also I, I say to my, you know, and I'm a practicing Jew. I, I you know, attend uh, temples and, and I do, you know, practice in that sense. Uh, and I do read the, the, the Torah every day. But um, but on the other hand, I tell my religiously, you know, um, much more predisposed colleagues and friends, you know, if you really believe in science, uh, or sorry, if you really believe in God, you should approach it through a scientific lens because it might be the only clue. You know, it might be that you know Yang Mills theory or you know Maxwell's equations or whatever are are the only hints that we can ever hope to get uh, of God talking in our language. But moreover, if you tell your children that you know life started purely because of a miracle, you know, then I think it limits their ability to at least search for you know, going back even further to primary, you know, the primary uh, source material, if you will, if you just say everything is done by God and every, every single thing is controlled by some agent that you have no access to because God is not revealing himself to us uh, and in our modern age. So I think that's incredibly stunting of my religious friends and the intelligent designers uh, beyond, you know, other, other challenges that I've posed to them. But I think you had a, Oh, go ahead. No, I just wanted to pick up there's something really interesting in your point, because one of the things that I've always found at conflict that I don't understand how to resolve is that intelligent design seems to me to be a principle that limits creativity in the universe. Like it means that creativity is not a physical thing. And mm -hmm. the way I approach the problem, even when you said, you know, it's not it's not necessarily the case that we should be able to learn the laws of nature on a university education timescale. Right. But we can. So I use that as observational evidence for the kind of physics I want to understand. And so then you have to construct the problem. Well, why is it we can comprehend reality? And what is that as a physical process? And I think intelligent design misses the ability to even ask that question because they assume all of that just came for free. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. so it, it, it's trying to explain us, but ultimately it really doesn't explain us. It it sweeps any explanation for what we are as special in the universe or different in the universe under the rug. And I think the one thing that I think is really deeply intriguing is as far as we know, there aren't any other physical systems like our modern technosphere and our participation in it as thinking agents that are conscious, right? And, and an ability to explain that it, it has got to be pretty profound and really interesting as far as how we understand ourselves and our relationship to the cosmos, but also what else might be, be out there. And so um, so I think your point about limiting, potentially limiting imagination is really um, 
the part that I would want to push back on. Mm -hmm. I'm open to alternative explanations. Yeah. Right. And I, I see you as a very, um, you know, uh, non-dogmatic, very, uh, you know, ecumenical thinker in that you're you're not going to have an open mind so open as Carl Sagan said, your brains fall out. <laughs> but on the other hand, you're willing to strengthen your position by taking an opposing perspective, which I find, you know, quite, quite the hallmark of the best scientists on earth. I, I think you had a beautiful statement. I, I forget where it was originally, but you said, um, uh, you talked about what's called the LUCA, uh, the last universal common ancestor, and you said that it is akin to my field, the last scattering surface of the cosmic microwave background. I thought that was one of the coolest uh, uh, analogies I've ever heard. Um, explain to people, what is LUCA? Who, who is LUCA? And uh, why is it uh, so important to study the oldest, most primitive things as we do with CMB photons? But why is it so important in, in the field that you've uh, chosen to, uh, to d dedicate so much of your intellectual effort to? Yeah, so um, so I think the actual equation between Luca and the CMB came from Nigel Goldenfeld, and I picked it up from him because he's. Oh, awesome. I think he's my new colleague here. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's cool. Yeah. So Not he, yet. you know, well. condensed matter physicist working on uh, origins of life would come up with those kind of analogies. But um, but I love it. I think it's. It, well, that's another hallmark for you, young people. I have to say, sorry to interrupt you, Sarah. Yeah. It's so interesting. But what Sarah just did is the hallmark of a true scientist. She gave proper attribution, uh, and it's actually in Judaism, it's considered a sin. Uh, it's, called, it's called stealing thought. Like when I ever hear somebody say, oh, I'm going to steal that joke. That's actually like a pretty big sin because people are going to attribute to you the credit that's owed to other people. And in academia, we, we don't get away with that in our papers, but you could have easily gotten away with that with me. I, I wouldn't have known, but it's a sign of an expert scientist to do what Sarah did. So for my young audience, I have a huge, very rabid young audience. That's uh, a lot of EDU addresses in my mailing list, which you should all subscribe to. Uh, but uh, I just want to point that, that out. Keep yep. going, everybody. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so go ahead. So what is this analogy? Mine's out there. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so the LUCA, what, what is it? Uh, so LUCA is an abbreviation of Last Universal Common Ancestor. Um, so the first sort of problem with that name is it's singular and mo and really we should be thinking about it as a population of cells on early Earth. And I think one of the people that spoke about this most eloquently was uh, Carl Woese. Um, who uh, discovered co-discovered the third domain of life with George Fox, but um, he made a lot of arguments about collective evolution in early life, um, and this idea. So, so Luca comes from tracing phylogenetic trees. So, if you look at all life on Earth, it has shared biochemical component parts, and if we trace those histories back in time, it kind of converges in what we call the last universal common ancestor. Um, and I guess my point of, of bringing up Carl Woese's ideas is a lot of people think that convergence means we're talking about a single cell that lived on early earth and everything radiated out of it. But what he really pushed was this idea that LUCA might have been a, itself a collective phenomena. And this is actually really how I think about it. I don't think that when some collective feature, just as if we like kind of zoomed out and looked at life today, there would be common biochemical component parts in every organism on earth today. Um, and, um, and that's a phenomena that exists across all known own life. So the reason for equating it to the CMB is that um, because we're using genomic information to reconstruct the last universal common ancestor, um, it's kind of like the last surface of information that we can look at. And, act and, and so going past it requires different tools um, in the sense that um, the genomic tools are not adequate. It's like the photons, you know, give us information from the C CMB, but not earlier because they were scattering too much. Um, and so we have this kind of boundary if we want to do these phylogenetic reconstructions. Um, so one of the things I'm really interested in um, scientifically, and this is something that I spend a lot of time working on with my students and postdocs, is trying to not look at genomic reconstructions of life, but look at patterns in biochemistry, like statistical patterns. So just like in statistical mechanics developed in the 1800s, we realized we could predict more features of engines and things by talking about temperature and pressure and work, and these kind of macro scale variables that coarse grain, you know, the exact position and momentum of every particle in a gas. Um, so far in biochemistry, we've been talking about the exact component parts. Luca had to have DNA. Luca had to have, well, we don't know if it had to have DNA, but like had to have ribosomes, had to have certain metabolism. Um, and, and people are trying to reconstruct the specific component parts. What we're trying to do is say Luca was a statistical pattern in print on early biochemistry. Um, and let's reconstruct what that pattern was and try to predict chemistries and environments associated to that pattern. Um, and we do that by using scaling laws and all kinds of other things, but we don't have to get into technical details. But then the idea is to try to understand 
when loof when life became universal in the sense that there's these shared biochemical component parts how do we understand the patterns in those chemistries that we can actually extrapolate further back than luca just based on those patterns which don't require genomic information Excellent. Um, so now moving out from our uh, vantage point on Earth, I do want to talk to you about more controversial topics like aliens, uh, extraterrestrial intelligence, UFOs. But before we get there, um, I understand that you know one of your, um, you know, I think it was your PhD thesis, as a matter of fact, involved uh, what's called homochirality. And um, and the existence, and I'm going to probably get this wrong, but the, here's how I remember it, uh, Sarah, and I'm looking, you know, for for to the world's expert perhaps on this. Uh, but I always remember that um, that DNA is right-handed, is a right-handed helix. Um, I don't know actually. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. Well, because it has sugars that are dextrose, right? The sugars are dextrose. Yeah, the sugars are right-handed. Yeah. I know that. So, yeah. like, because I was working at the the <laughs> level of like small molecule symmetry breaking, oh, and right. it, the sugars are right-handed. And for amino acids, it's left-handed amino acids. Left-handed, right? But actually, I oh, you know why I get confused on DNA? Why? Because it was wrong in some textbook. And I never remember which orientation was right because it it was like it wasn't that one. But now I have in my mind anytime I hear which one it is, it wasn't that one. Uh, <laughs> well, here's how here, I'm going to teach you a mnemonic to remember it. Uh, so DNA uh, is is right-handed because life finds a way to be right. Oh, right? I see. Okay. okay, that's the way I remember it. And there, but but neutrinos are left-handed. Uh, neut- or ordinary news. So that's how I, I. So if somebody asks me, is a neutrino right-handed or left-handed? I think oh, DNA is the opposite of a neutrino. So therefore, nice. DNA is right-handed because life finds the right way. Then neutrino. Okay. Anyway, uh, we'll probably have to edit this out. This is so boring. But anyway, um, but imagine you're looking out into space, and uh, you know somebody tells you that are they they just returned and they they got some you know ancient stromatolites uh, from pro, uh, from uh, you know planet uh, that or orbits around uh, Proxima Centauri B or whatever, right? Um, you test it, and it's um, has equal amounts. You know, it's it's hetero chiral, I guess. Um, do you say this guy's a fraud, or you know this is nonsense? Uh, in, in other words, what is essential about the chirality? Uh, to the nature of life, if anything. Um, yeah, so so there are some arguments that only homochiral, so one chirality biopolymer, so like when you take those right-handed sugars, you start linking them together, um, or amino acids, only those would be functional. But it's actually really hard to test that experimentally because synthesizing you know, populations of heterochiral polymers is hard because all of our enzymes for synthesizing polymers were derived from biology, which has a particular orientation to it as far as, so it's easy to make like a left-handed um, uh, protein, uh, you know, left-handed amino acids. You can maybe make a right-handed one because you could imagine re- reversing everything, but doing something in between is actually quite hard. Um, so, so that's, so there's kind of this implicit assumption that functionality in life requires homochirality. Um, I'm actually really interested in a kind of different feature of chirality more recently. So when I was a a PhD student, I was working on symmetry breaking. So physicists love symmetry breaking problems, right? So if you have two things, they're left-handed, right-handed, and you only observe the left-handed one and otherwise equivalent, that's, you know, a symmetry breaking problem. And it turns out you can make that problem kind of equivalent to like an icing, um, phase transition, like when you have an up and down spin. And so I was working on models of how you get that symmetry breaking prebiotically. Um, But the thing that I've gotten more interested in recently is actually thinking about chirality as a system level property. So if you think of like a biochemical network, like the small molecule chemistry that biochemistry catalyzes, all of those molecules are either achiral or they have some chiral orientation to them. And one of these things that we've been doing with this kind of statistical mechanics of biochemistry is looking at patterns in life's use of chiral molecules versus achiral molecules. And it turns out there's very statistically rigorous scaling laws. Like if you look at a biochemical system and you look at the size, it's it's increase in size, so number of molecules that that organism uses in its biochemistry, there's a scaling law of how many of those are chiral versus achiral. Um, And the reason to me that's really interesting is, one, it doesn't require appealing to these large macromolecules to talk about chirality is an interesting feature because this is small molecule chemistry. So this is getting at the origin of life scale that somehow chirality is actually playing a role in the structure of networks that become living. Um, And if I want to get to the deeper physics of that, I think that's actually deeply associated to what we're doing in assembly theory and also thinking about time, like we were talking about 
um, earlier. Because if you think about a chiral molecule and you have these two handednesses, basically it's like a symmetry breaking in time if you choose one over the other, because now you're talking about not just that molecule, but all the pa assembly pathways for making that molecule and all the ways that it interacts with things in the future. So chirality, I think, is playing this really interesting way about funneling um, biological systems down specific kinds of trajectories in assembly spaces or in time. Um, and that's some theory I'm trying to work on that's motivated. Right now we're working, we have these patterns in biochemistry that we've elucidated and we're writing a paper on that now. But I, in the long term, I'd really like to think about a more fundamental theory for chirality, sort of like how chirality was brought into like QFT and all these other things at some point. Like, you know, chir chirality always comes up as interesting in physics. And I think about it more like a physicist because I'm, I'm more interested in like in, in those kind of questions. And I don't think we've gotten to the point where we can ask those yet, but I can see hints of where there's really, really interesting physics happening for chirality. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, uh, and I think, yeah, that maybe connects back to where we were um, in the very beginning, but in the, at least in the, in the context of, of cosmic analogies, what we want to do is look out and uh, see gravity, see the forces of nature when they were in, you know, what's called the linear regime. And I'm, you know, my, my simple minded way of thinking about it is like, what's the analog of the biological linear regime, you know, yeah. about which we could do perturbation, but maybe that's not the right way to think about it. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I, I like that. I will. I will dwell on it. Okay. Don't steal it without. It. I won't <laughs> steal it. I'll catch. I'll, I'll catch you right-handed, Sarah. Um, so you spoke in this paper very presciently, also the original life problem for physics, um, about the James Webb Space Telescope, which recently not only launched but made it to the L two orbit and also assembled itself like uh, origami or some living, you know, uh, structure. Um, you talk about that in the paper and what we could see and and uh, and so forth uh, with with planets, uh, um, you know, maybe going in front of these stars. And I wonder, you know, uh, could we really see, you know, evidence? You, you're probably familiar of this um, of this discovery, this announcement, you know, touted so highly um, recently by past Sarah guest on the podcast, Sarah Seeger, um, and other colleagues, uh, Jane Greaves and others, the phosphine on Venus, um, you know. Uh, I don't know how pertinent that is to your particular research, but at least the James Webb Space Telescope prospects for detecting life on other skies, um, you link that in sort of a Bayesian framework. I wonder, could, could you talk about what excites you about the Webb Telescope and, and, and what do you think we're likely to learn and, and how much could we really shrink the Bayesian confidence intervals by a discovery from Webb alone? Um, yeah, these are great questions. So I, ha I have thought a lot about exoplanet uh, biosignature science, and in particular using Bayesian approaches where, and part of the, the whole set of arguments there is if you're assessing the significance of a biosignature, um, so biosignatures are, you know, things that we can associate to life, but they tend to be for exoplanets, really simple molecules like phosphine is an example on Venus, but phosphine was developed as a biosignature for exoplanets um, because they're remotely detectable. So other examples are things like oxygen and methane. Um, and this becomes very problematic as it did in the case of Venus because there's a lot of possibilities of false positives. We can't exhaustively... Um, uh, get rid of all the possible abiotic explanations for those kind of biosignatures. So, so this kind of um, bothers me on a few levels. Uh, one of them is that I really am interested in trying to encourage the astrobiology community to move more toward having motivating theory. We're not looking for a biosignature, we're looking for life. And if you can't come back, come, connect that signature of life to a fundamental understanding of what life is, and you're not learning something new about life by testing some hypothesis about what life is on an alien world and getting you know some feedback about that phenomena that you're looking at, I don't think that it's quite the kind of science astrobiology should be doing yet. Um, so I think, I think the way we're doing biosignature science right now is by analogy to um, life on Earth. So we're taking molecules that metabolism produce on Earth and looking for those in exoplanets. And we don't know the mechanisms of how they could be produced abiotically or biologically on those planets. And it's a little uh, analogy I like to make is like, we don't take geological maps from Mars and expect them to, are, you know, to apply to Earth or vice versa, right? So we don't take, you know, the Grand Canyon and expect it to explain the morphology of, of Vallis Mariner. However, how is that pronounced? Mar 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 <laughs> I was going to say Marinara, and I'm like, <laughs> this is what I mean, right? Right. 
Right. So, so, but there's this implicit assumption we can take the chemical map from Earth for biochemistry and apply it to a different planet. And I think that's really um, uh, a mistake. But if you want to do that, there are rigorous ways of thinking about it. And you can ask, well, what is the likelihood of an abiotic mechanism generating that versus a biological mechanism? And the problem is that we don't, and then you could kind of plug those likelihoods into a Bayesian framework. And if you had a prior um, you know, model for the original life on that planet, you could actually, you know, get some probability of assigning that as a biosignature. And so it gives kind of a framework for asking questions about, you know, am I really detecting life or not that's quantitative and statistically rigorous? The challenge we have is we don't know what the abiotic um, probabilities are or the biological ones or the prior um, for most biosignatures. Um, so I think James Webb will help a lot because it's going to give us a lot more of a baseline of what planets are like beyond our solar system and give more detailed um, uh detailed observations. But I think the kind of thing that I'm more excited about is like um uh, you know, there's this whole proposal for Laboir Hab X, and they're doing these more statistical types of surveys of planets. And I think that's really what we need to do. We need to have a better baseline of what exoplanet properties are. Um, and we need to build better theories, and this is one of the reasons I do this, um, for predicting um, non-ambiguous biosignatures. Because if you look at, like, Bayes' equation for uh, detecting life, and you have like some probability that the signature you're looking at is actually attributable to life. There's a couple terms that matter. One is, is it possible to be produced abiotically? If it is, you have a false positive scenario. And then you need a really strong mechanism for the origin of life. You need a really, really big prior. <laughs> you really have to be really confident that it's actually produced by life. Or you have to have a really strong biosignature that's not subject to false positives. And so that's one of the reasons that I think assembly theory is very promising, because if you have a high assembly object, there, you know, the structure of that is such that we don't expect there to be false positives. Um, and so if you don't know the prior for the original life and you want to go survey the universe for life without knowing that prior, then you have to have some kind of signature for life that has that structure. It doesn't have to be assembly, but right now I think that's the only candidate we have. And is a, is assembly, you know, going to potentially be the Drake equation of biochemistry and alien, you know, biochemistry? Well, the Drake equation is a way of organizing ignorance, right? So the Drake equation is supposed to be filled in by other science, right? right. And so a lot of people still want to use it to make estimates because we have a lot, to, uh, you know, that was proposed in what, 1963 by Frank Drake. Yeah. So if you think about... Um, you know, how many discoveries we've made since then, we know the likelihood of planet formation, we kind of have some bounds on the likelihood of Earth-like planets, mm -hmm. but that probability for the original life term is completely unconstrained mm -hmm. uh, because we don't know the mechanism for the origin life. Right. Um, so uh, I think what assembly will give us is if we could go, say, if you could go and, and survey a bunch of planets and say, did the origin life happen on this planet, then you could bound that S of L. Right. Um, and, mm -hmm. and that's the way astrobiologists sh should be thinking about it, I think, is how do we actually infer the likelihood of life from the data sets we're given, not having an aha moment where we're going to immediately see <laughs> some signatures and, and it's going to just be life. Like, that's right. not how science works. Yeah, I often point that out, you know, just riffing on what you just said. You know, science is not about, like, getting the answer and then just submitting the answer, you know, there's, uh, there's, uh, you know, 2000 planets in our, in our you know, galactic spiral arm. No, no, I want to know the uncertainty on it. And the problem with the Drake equation is that it's always presented as here's the number and there's never error analysis associated with it. So is that true of assembly theory too? Is it just going to give you a number, you know, probability, or is it going to give you some bounded error bars and some Bayesian interval confidence? Interval? Oh, no. So, yeah. It, so one of the things with the whole like Bayesian approach to biosignature science is it allows you to invent new kinds of biosignatures that fit in that formalism. And assembly theory is structured that way because it's a, um, it's a theory that naturally accommodates probabilistic assessment. So the whole idea is like with this, so empirically, um, you know, Lee's lab identified that if you have more than 15 steps to produce a molecule in the shortest assembly pathway, then it's exponentially unlikely to be produced. And if we see it, then it becomes a signature of life. And that was like empirically validated against experiments. And right now we have some theory that corroborates why there's a threshold value um, that we're working on now in the current paper. So the theory would predict there should be a crossover point where you, where you wouldn't expect this um, by, by um, 
a non-biological process, basically, or, or a process that didn't undergo selection um, or didn't have any kind of information or causation in the system. Um, so, so if you, you buy that sort of argument, basically what it's saying is above 15, it's exponentially unlikely to ever observe those molecules. And there's a two-part argument to it. It's not just it's 15 steps, but when you see a molecule and you observe it with your instrument, like a mass spec, you have to have multiple copies of it. Um, and so you might argue... <laughs> say, based on the Boltzmann brain argument, and people do this, they're like, well, geochemistry can make anything. And I'm always like, well, geochemistry can't make a cell phone. Where do you draw the line? But um, I mean, the line has to be somewhere. Otherwise, you're arguing for intelligent design. And I think people really don't understand this. It's either biological agents or the designers or the universe has some kind of intrinsic uh, design-based laws. Um, and since I, I, I'm looking for uh, the, the situation where we can explain that physics internal to the universe and don't have to appeal external, then it's not that you can get certain objects for free. It's that there has to be specific pathways constructed to make those objects. Um, and so with that argument means that when you find one cell phone, you don't find just one cell phone. You find that everybody on the planet has a cell phone. It's not an isolated occurrence like people. You know, you would never expect a single person to appear in the universe. You would expect a population of people. Um, you would never expect a single copy of a molecule to appear in the universe. It needs to be in a population of molecules if it's part of a process that's reliable to produce that molecule and it's not a statistical fluke and it's actually part of an evolutionary product. Now, there might be some smearing of the distribution. Not all people are identical. Not all molecules need to be identical, but they need to be somewhere related in the assembly space. Um, and we have ways of accounting for that. So then, um, then the idea is if you find these molecules that are past that threshold, then you've found evidence that there had to be some kind of causal mechanisms producing them or some kind of selection or what or information or what all these words, emergence, complexity, you know, whatever word you want to associate to life, but it's evidence of life. So it's, so it's agnostic as to, you know, what, what, um, type of chemistry could produce it? You know, could you have silicon-based life? Could you have, you know, in other words, are you are, are there biases or, or, you know, confirmation errors that might be imposed? There are, so one of the things that I, I think is of interest is trying to understand the assembly structure of different kinds of physical systems. So it might be that silicon doesn't, you would never expect to see high assembly things in silicon just because of the way the assembly looks in silicon chemistry. Um, but my anticipation is that probably, yes, you would still expect it. Now, one thing is that depending on the structure of the system that you're looking at, you might expect the threshold value to be different. So we can predict features based on the causal structure of the assembly space of where that transition should be, where it's necessary to have some kind of informational system produce that object. But we expect that transition to happen in any kind of assembly space. And that transition happens just because you're talking about a system that is combinatorially huge. So the number of ways of making that object um, grows exponentially with the, the, the size of the object. Um, and so there's this kind of transition where the, path, the number of pathways for assembling it is too large for you to expect it to form by chance. Um, and that's a fundamental feature of any combinatorial system where you impose a causal structure on it. Um, so, so, so that's sort of the, the underlying premise of assembly theory is basically saying when you see things past that boundary for that particular uh, assembly, that particular kind of causal structure combinatorial space, that's evidence of life or that's evidence of the physics underlying life. I see. Um, and then one, one thing that we talked about um, maybe on Clubhouse a you know, longer time ago, uh, <laughs> you know, it's kind of this, this, Notion that I again was brought up with Lee and 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 I and Kurt, which was you know that are the properties of life encoded in the Big Bang in some sense. And before I get to that, I want to ask you know can assembly theory discard like irrelevant or low value information? For example, people talk about water. You know, oh, we found water. You know, uh, and and on Mars, and there's evidence of. I'm like, of course, you know, hydrogen is the most common element. Oxygen is like the fourth most common. Of course, you're going to find a lot of water. Um, you know, so in other words, is that you know finding water is that is that dispositive? Is that in any way, or is can you just exclude it because it's so abundant? It's 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 almost like a nuisance parameter. Yeah. So. Um... So assembly theory is falsifiable. Like if you found a high assembly thing and you couldn't associate it to life, you can falsify the theory. But I think one of the things is it's trying to get rid of all those kind of details. Um, and the water argument is more of one of habitability than life, right? So, so there has been 
traditionally also in astrobiology, this confusion between talking about the components of life as life, right? So that's like, you know, these single molecules become represent like oxygen. Oxygen is not life. Oxygen could be a signature of life with a whole set of other assumptions associated to it. Um, and uh, DNA is not life either. DNA is evidence of life because it's high assembly object. It requires a lot of design and evolution. Oxygen is kind of, so you can see where those fall on in sort of an assembly structure. But things like water are preconditions for life, right? Assumed preconditions based on what we know of life on Earth. So life on Earth requires water. Therefore, we go look for environments with water because we assume that life couldn't exist in the environments that don't have water. So it's kind of like we're trying to screen out the search space um, and focus it in. But um, but assembly theory is kind of agnostic to that because it just says you need to have an environment that life could emerge, whatever environment that is, and and that um, and life could build complex things. And then you would look for those complex things. Now it might be that some environments life doesn't build complex things and they're below the assembly threshold. Um, but there are also ways that we can detect features of selection or light of information processing below that that we're still developing. Oh. Interesting. Um, and then what did you make of this, uh, this conjecture by, uh, by Avi Loeb that, you know, the universe was once, uh, you know, at, at age, you know, at the re at a redshift of 100, the universe was approximately room temperature, meaning that you could have a liquid water, um, and actually over a wide variety of time scales. And uh, so liquid water was, was per perhaps abundant in the, you know, just ambient universe. Uh, does this, does that play a role, you know, cosmic connect? I'm trying to push back the last, what I want to do is push the last common Luca back to the last scattering surface. So uh, I want to get a close up. And um, I just don't see the utility. I mean, yeah. what, what does that give you? It just, yeah. it gives you an interesting thing to say. I think it's curious. I think there could be something there, but do, do I follow the chain of logic to say, oh, I have observational signatures of life living right. in that period of the universe and I haven't seen anybody actually go that far. So, I mean, I can spend all day making wild conjectures about w what life, what could be life and where it could be in the universe. I have a million ideas a day about it, but I think the thing is like, if you really want to discover aliens and some of us really do, I mean, a lot of us do, Abby included, right? Like then we have to sit down and we have to really think rigorously about the problem and develop theories that we can test and things that we can do in the lab, observations we can make with telescopes and theory that we can build. And those three things have to work together just like mm -hmm. they do in, in physics. But astrobiology hasn't transitioned because it's not a mature science yet. It's a really new field and it's bringing together a lot of areas of science that haven't worked together before. Yeah. We don't know how to ask the question of life. We we make a lot of assumptions that we know what we are, and um, and you know the we, we I'll know it when I see it is so pervasive. I'm glad that you brought that up earlier. It's funny, but it's true because people assume we're life. We know it when we see it, but yeah. So so I think I think yes, it's fun. To, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's fun to talk about the water in the early universe and, and could it have been the case that life could have emerged really early in the universe, but I don't think it's helpful to any discussion about actually solving any of the problems that we're dealing with. Okay. Well, remaining on the Avi Loeb uh, bandwagon for a second. Uh, so he's had, uh, you know, kind of a, a lot of um, maybe dissonant Con conflicts with uh, the astro astronomy community, but primarily, you know, what, what he's advocating for is that we spend all this money on, on you know, kind of wasteful science, string theory, and and you know, bigger and bigger accelerators and so forth. But what we sh really should be studying is not even spending it on SETI, which is like information. Um, looking for uh, techno signatures in the you know, radio wave or light waves. Uh, and as I mentioned before, they really pivoted from, you know, the pure core mission that they had from Drake's time until, you know, and Morrison until today, which is looking for extremophiles and, and all sorts of other, you know, life on earth at redshift zero. Um, but what do you make of his claims that sort of, you know, we should be looking for physical, you know, techno signatures like, like this little chunk of Oumuamua that I captured uh, not too long ago going across my, my uh, but, but tell me, what are your thoughts about this? You should make that into an NFT. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I have been actually. I did get approached by somebody who does is making NFT meteorites, and I'm just like, um, all right. Well, don't look down. Don't look. Um, well, tell me, what do you think about a muamua? I don't think I've um, asked you this before. Yeah. So I think some of the features of being open minded and realizing that aliens could be right in front of us and and it might just pass us by are really um, good about the way that Abby is approaching some of these questions. 
Um, but I think in the case of um, um, I can never pronounce this one either. Um, oh, um, mua mua. Um, mua mua. It's not. Um, it's not marinara. I was going to make it. This is one like you could run the whole Bayesian thing we just talked about, and there yeah. are really good models, actually, including developed by one of my colleagues here, uh, Steve Dash at ASU, that explain um, mua mua in terms of completely natural. Um, explanation, including some of the anomalies that um, Abby talked about in his book, like they've been basically like all of these sort of features. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of evidence that, you know, suggests it could have a natural origin and it's not an anomaly. Um, now, the real issue, I think, is not um, 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 and the debate around that, but the whole issue of are anomalies adequate to assign alien as the explanation? Mm -hmm. And we do this everywhere. We do it in UFO science. We can't explain it. It's aliens. Amuamua. We can't explain it. It's aliens. Uh, biosignature science. Phosphine on Venus. We can't explain it abiotically. It's aliens. Saucers. Um, yeah, saucers. Yeah. So oh, I, I think, I think culturally, mm -hmm. culturally, and this is ubiquitous across scientists, members of the public, everyone. Aliens right now are the other. They're the explanation for things we can't explain. Mm -hmm. And I just don't feel like that's adequate. I don't, I think if we don't understand what something is, we should say it's an anomaly. If we have a mechanism and we can explain it, and that mechanism happens to be associated to the phenomena we call life, mm -hmm. and we can say this is an example of life that's not us, then we use the alien hypothesis. Right. But it's not science if I'm just saying everything that I don't understand is alien. What about my your former colleague and uh, you know Paul Davies and current colleague also uh, you know talks about the shadow biosphere right on the other side of the hall. Yeah. Uh, right yeah <laughs> I could knock on the door yeah yes. um, you know, the shadow biosphere and these lurkers in our solar yeah. system and as he wrote about it, I pointed out to him you know we've done multiple interviews one was on the eerie silence on the on the tenth anniversary of its publication which was itself on the fiftieth anniversary of the SETI program kicking off yeah the silence has only grown more deafening in that realm so. His, his theory of, you know, shadow biospheres and so forth. Yeah. What do you make of that? Isn't that just kind of saucers by another, by another name? Um, other by another name. Um, well, I think the shadow biosphere was intended to be a hypothesis to be tested, right? So the idea was um, if life is not a singular event in the universe and it's common um, and it's common on earth-like planets the most earth-like planet is earth and we know the origin of life happened once here so maybe it happened twice and we just haven't actually recognized that yet um, and actually there's a lot of historical precedent for this because we have discovered alien life on earth that we didn't know about it just happened that we found out later it was related to us so for example you know for most of human history we didn't know microbes existed we had to develop the technology of microscopes to actually literally see that there were these organisms basically living in our bread and you know on the tabletop and pretty much everywhere around us but that was a completely hidden quote unquote shadow biosphere for most of human history and so the argument is um, if it's not DNA based life and we're only combing the seas like in Craig Venter's things, you know, going through the ocean, combing up life and, and detecting it based on DNA sequences, what are we missing? Um, and so, so Paul's very adamant that, you know, it's cheaper to look for life on Earth than it is to go look for life on Mars. So why don't we just have a concerted effort to look for an alien example of life on Earth that isn't actually alien to Earth, it's just alien to us because it's also originating on Earth. Um, and my personal perspective on it is that's a well-posed scientific question, and we should be doing that. I think from the philosophical side of how I approach the science and what's consistent with the kind of theories I do and the kind of work that my group has been doing, uh, thinking about the global organization of biochemistry and patterns in biochemistry, I don't think that you can have more than one example of life per planet. Um, and um, because I think life becomes a globally integrated system pretty quickly, and it's actually like a planetary scale process. And you can think about that even with modern technology and the global internet and how we're all increasingly connected. I just, I don't see, you think about life as, as information propagating and the kind of structure of it. I don't see the possibility of having more than one life form on the planet. But from the perspective of, is it a well-posed scientific question? Yes, it absolutely is. And it's, and, and I, and just to, I, I didn't mean to imply that like the, the whole set of biosignatures from UFOs to phosphine are not well posed. I just don't want, like, you need to have a conjecture there, like, about why is this life and actual, like, a theoretical support. Um, otherwise, like, I, I just, I don't understand the mentality. And maybe I'm just missing something, but I, I feel like there's more rigorous ways of approaching the problem that people have just shied away from historically because the life problem is so hard. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so if you'll indulge me for another 10 minutes, maybe we have some audience questions. Is that going to work? 
Okay, good. So first question um, comes from <clears throat> uh, Dylan Graham Hussman on my YouTube channel, comment community section. It's Dr. Brian Keating on YouTube. Uh, Dylan asks, given the non-ergotic nature of life and the vastness of genetic search space, do you think mutation and thus evolution is purely random? Or do you think there's a set of principles that constrain the space of mutations to places more likely to produce adaptive change? So is this kind of uh, evolution being pre-patterned for certain adaptions? Yeah, is it purely random or is it, or is it you know, traceable to some sort of you know, set of yeah. principles maybe designed? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know where I stand on that. Like, so some days I think that there's some intrinsic randomness in the universe and other days I think it's totally deterministic. Um, so, so I'm personally deeply intrigued by this. I think that there definitely is some contingency in, um, you know, what mutations happen and which, and the ways they're adaptive. And certainly there's been experiments done to show certain features of that kind of contingency. So it doesn't seem that they're all totally random, like certain parts of the genome are more biased toward mutation than others is a simple example. Um, and then you can ask questions about why, and there's tons of people that are way more qualified to talk about those kinds of, you know, specific genomic questions than I, I am. But I think, I think the question of whether, um, whether the universe requires some kind of underlying stochasticity or randomness in order for life to exist is a really deeply intriguing one. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, next question comes from a uh, audience member named Rust in Peace, which was coincidentally the name for my uh, first daughter. No, no, I'm just kidding. Um, and he or she asks, could it be uh, that a, li a living organism doesn't require a cell wall or you know some kind of container? Um, I think there's certainly a po so I don't I don't think life has boundaries in the traditional sense. Um, I do think that you need bounded. Uh, bounded structures, but I don't think like, you know, the container is the thing that's important. So as I mentioned before, like a cell reconstructs itself and is part of a lineage and the lineage is really what we need to think about with life. So the boundary plays a role in terms of saying this is a packet of information that's reproducing itself in a, in a, in a particular structure. But then, you know, organisms can exchange genes with each other or even now like we're exchanging knowledge. So the boundaries are not as important as sort of the flow of information in the system. So I think it's kind of a secondary feature. And in fact, there's some things that, you know, individuality the idea of like bounded individuals might have emerged late in the origin of life and that you might have just had much more collective or like system level properties early on. And I, I, I resonate with those kind of ideas. I think they're, they're really intriguing. So maybe, you know, really primitive life is not bounded, but maybe once you get into this kind of Darwinian and well-defined information or lineage as it becomes bounded. Uh, next question from Vorador. What is your opinion regarding the chances to find life on, let's say, he or she asked about Europa specifically, but what about other places in our solar system? Um, I think it's possible for, for life to be a lot of places in our solar system and that we just really haven't figured out how to identify it yet. I think Europa is hard uh, mission-wise because you have to drill through the ice shell. <laughs> Um, and so getting a sample is really challenging, but I, so, um, for that reason, I'm much more on team Enceladus, so to say, like, I'm very enthusiastic about sending missions to Enceladus because Enceladus is very similar to Europa, another icy moon, um, you know, has a liquid ocean under its shell, but it actually has active jets of, um, material being spewed into space. So you can imagine flying, a, you know, a, a robot through the plume and taking samples. Um, so you don't have to worry about the drilling problem. And from a habitability perspective of like, you know, are the ingredients for life present on these icy moons? I think Enceladus is just as strong a candidate as Europa. So that just becomes an accessibility issue. Great. Uh, another frequent guest on my channel, the memes of destruction or audience member. That's another good name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> these are all great band names. <laughs> I know. There's another one, Chimbrazo. We'll get to that. Uh, he asked, are stars alive? I'm going to change that to, um, you know, what's the minimum, you know, kind of astrophysical entity that you could say uh, is alive or, or features life? Uh, could you have a dark cloud like Arthur C. Clarke or, uh, you know, what, what's the minimum uh, common ancestor, you know, planet, uh, it, you know stellar astrophysical uh, prerequisite? Yeah, so so this is not the way I would ask that question. Um, so I'm going to answer. Yeah, so because it's kind of like the what is life question, and then what are other examples of life? This is what we would canonically think, and I just don't think that's the right way of framing it. What I I would think is 
clearly we exist in the universe as life, which means that the laws of physics are structured for life to exist. And I'm interested in those laws that specifically explain life, which my claim is are not the laws of physics as we know them now. They're different kind of law of physics and they have very different, the laws of physics that explain life have very different properties. For example, they're not cast in this kind of initial state, fixed law of motion kind of framework, uh, which we didn't talk about, but like that's an aside. But anyway, just imagine, you know, there, there is some structure to the universe, causal structure. The universe is a causal graph, so to speak, an assembly space. Um, then everything has that property, just like everything um, has the property of existing in space and time in, in gravity, right? Like there's a space-time manifold that defines the properties of the universe. And then some physical systems like us are very high assembly. And you could think of them like in the gravitational analogy as being objects that have very strong gravitational potential wells, like planetary systems, galaxies, or black holes are good examples to study gravitational physics. Things that are good examples to study causal structure in the universe or this kind of feature of information being causal or whatever you want to call it are living things. Um, now, is that apparent in, in other examples like stars or other kinds of systems we could study? Of course it should be because it's a feature of our universe. Um, but the question is, to what degree? Um, and so I wouldn't really call things alive unless they're very high assembly objects, like the kind that we talk about in terms of molecular assembly theory, but assembly is supposed to be general and apply to anything. Um, and so I don't think stars have crossed that threshold, but I think that stars have, uh, you know, like you can think about the contingency and stellar generations and the kind of elemental distributions they have. They do have a, a clear, this population of stars had to come before this population of stars. Otherwise, there's no reason for this elemental distribution. So they have a causal structure associated to them. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Next question uh, comes uh, from Chim Brazo. He asks a bunch of questions. One is about humans and aliens interacting. How would we communicate with them? You could ask, answer that question. He also asked, why does a grand unified theory have to be beautiful? I guess my question to you would be, you know, what, what about these, um, you know, the, your f love of physics, your love of cosmology, your, your kind of OG uh, historical uh, legacy. Uh, what, what interests you most and what do you find most interesting about um, the searches that are kind of layered upon them is this question of beauty and, and uh, propriety, if you will, in the laws of nature. We talked about symmetry earlier. Uh, what do you make of that? Is that, is that baggage? Is that a, a shibboleth? What's going on with that? <laughs> no. Um, so, so on the question of beauty, I think... Um, you know, a lot of people think that's problematic for physics, and I think it can because I think, you know, there are obvious areas where maybe we get romanticized by certain ideas and then we lose track of, you know, where's, where's the scientific rigor. But I also think um, that our attraction to beauty and the way we explain the world is probably a signature also of the physics of what we are and is not just like an ad hoc feature added onto it. Um, but I think, um, I think it just depends on what your aesthetic is. Um, and for me, I think the aesthetic is, is it explanatory? I don't, I don't, um, and how much does it explain? Um, and I'm also deeply interested in, in, I, in theories that are empowering. So I think, um, and what I mean by that is because I think theories actually are causal and they matter to how the world we live in locally on our planet works because the theories become the reality we live in. Um, it is important to try to pick ones that maximize kind of the potential for humanity. So it's not like an aesthetic choice, but it's more of a, well, it is an aesthetic choice, but it's an aesthetic choice informed by thinking about theories as physical objects and like what they do. So, um, so I guess I don't have any problem with people choosing aesthetic choices, but I think that, I guess my point is we need to be very cognizant about why we're making those choices, how it's related to the physics that we're developing um, and where the biases are coming in. Um, and so one thing I always try to do is, is try to understand what my own biases are. And my, my biggest bias is I'm trained as a theoretical physicist, so I tend to think like one, and we have a lot of baggage that we go with. <laughs> um, and I'm okay with that, but it might not be the right way of even asking the life problem, right? It could be like, you know, physics is completely irrelevant, but I don't think that's true, but, but it's entirely possible. Good. So now I'll move to Twitter, to the Twitter space, where you maybe have seen some of the questions posed to you. The first one uh, we'll choose from Caitlin McShay, um, Santa Fe McShay. And by the way, you should all follow uh, Sarah at uh, Sarah underscore Imari. I am. Follow Caitlin too. She's amazing. Follow Caitlin. You just got a shout out, Caitlin. Hope you're watching and listening. I'm a big fan of Caitlin. Yes, you. What's your favorite philosophical textbook? 
or book? Uh, or book? Uh, this is a hard one. I think um, I should have looked at these ahead. It would. Be, <laughs> um, <laughs> I think um, I think it's always nice to kind of know like the like early like ideas of how people think. So. I'm not a philosopher by training. I took one philosophy class, and it happened to be when I was at community college. Um, and I've always had an interest in philosophy, but it's kind of like one of these things that now that I'm a, a middle-aged physicist, I'm starting to read more philosophy because I need help. Um, <laughs> but, um, but when I was a student, um, I think I really like was I was so struck by two things. One was in my physics class, the fact that we could predict mon magnetic monopoles, and we, we couldn't know we could look for them. Sorry, I don't know where my lights went and they're not coming back. Oh, there they are. And the other one was um, uh, Thomas Aquinas's arguments for the existence of God, which I thought were so clever. Um, and so I, I really enjoyed reading that. I don't, I don't know. Really, I think, um, I think both of those together really gave me some insight into the power of human thought and how far we could push it. And since I became a physicist, that was always the thing I was romanticized by is the fact that again, it goes back to like, why is reality comprehensible and why are our brains structured to even reason about these kind of problems? And look how far we can actually push that reasoning, both in the sort of abstract philosophical arguments um, that we might want to run through, or in the sense that we can predict features of the universe and actually go and look and verify if they're true or not. Um, and I think those those two things are are, are just really important features. And so, so I guess that's kind of a, a half-assed answer, but... An answer <laughs> I like it very much. Uh, next question, also coming from Twitter. There's about 50 from uh, one person, uh, Sandy Pichaldi. Uh, but I'll just ask um, uh, one of it. He says, basically, what does it even mean that time can flow in any other direction than before to after, i.e. what we call forward? I don't know, because I think time only flows forward. <laughs> I don't know why most people think it can go backward. Um, so so I'm with you on that question. Please, someone explain to me why it could go backward. <laughs> All um, right. Well, you can. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think sort of just a, like a, I, I think, you know, yeah, never mind. We'll just leave it at that. That's good. <laughs> And then uh, Bryant Woe Times asked, what does fine tuning of initial conditions have to do with free will? Okay, um, I think I might have made this argument on Twitter at one point. Um, Which you should all follow because she's hilarious, prolific, philosophical, brilliant on Twitter. Thank you. Masterful. <laughs> um, so what? Uh, what? So the, it, so there's this whole sort of conception in current physics that in order to explain the complexity now, like you know the fact that we're sitting here on this podcast talking and you guys are listening. Um, was a feature then like in, like can be traced back deterministically to like the initial state of the universe. So so then this becomes a fine tuning argument because in order to explain all the variation and all the structure we have in the universe, it had to be some minor fluctuations in the initial condition of the universe, and the initial condition had to be fairly ordered to explain why disorder hasn't reigned. So there's all these kind of criteria on the initial state of the universe um, that are imposed by the features that we observe now. Um, and if you trace that chain of logic, um, basically it means that it's sort of every action that you're doing now was already pre-imprinted in the initial state of the universe. So there's sort of a conflict between current physics and free will at a cosmological scale because it, it's not really, it goes back to the intelligent design versus creativity discussion we were having earlier, um, that these questions are actually deeply buried in the logic of how we talk about physics. Um, and it goes back to this idea that sort of the laws exist outside the universe and, and the only thing you need to specify what happens in the universe is basically the initial condition. So once you set that in motion, everything is, is predetermined. Um, and I don't think that's the right paradigm for talking about life, mind, free will, or any of the problems that, you know, you hit up against when you're talking about what happens in biology versus what happens in physics. And it's not that physics as we know it is wrong. It's just that the kind of structure of the equations that we study in physics are not the right kind of structure of the equations for those kind of problems. I got it. And then the last question before we wrap up with closing arguments uh, is from Stur DeVant, who asks, how often are my cells created in origins experiments and in nature? Um, how important is a lipid bilayer to first life? Uh, it's interesting that my, my cell is used to protect plasmids in GMOs as well as mRNA vaccines. Uh, 
uh, is that essential? Uh, do you know what these micelles are? Can you define them? Um, I, so a lot of people talk in Origins of Life about um, forming vesicles. So like if you have fatty acids, they basically self-organize into spherical, spherical structures. So you can have, so there's some hypotheses about cells before life that you had, you know, these micelles or vesicles forming and then some molecules got in them and they they learned to co-replicate and then that was sort of the way you jump started life so those are usually considered to be protocell models um i don't know how frequently they occur my understanding is you just have some fatty acids they just self-assemble this way so then the question becomes how do you synthesize enough fatty acids to be able to do this um and uh and i'm i'm by no means a, a membrane expert um <laughs> knowing those things. Um, so I would not be the person to ask about sort of the details of the chemistry on that, but I always find those things deeply intriguing too. Well, Sarah, is there anything that we haven't covered today that you'd be interested in touching on in this? Uh, we've had a nice oh, over two, oh, hour and a half conversation, but is there anything else that I forgot or didn't uh, neglected to ask? Uh, I, I don't think so. What's next that? for you? Do you have any big talks coming? Any any thoughts about a book? Anything uh, fun? Well, I am actually stuff? writing a book. But I'm you like, are? Yeah. Oh, awesome. So, um, a popular book or a textbook? Yeah, yeah, it's a popular awesome. book, and it's on it's on life and what life is. Um, awesome. Yeah. That's an exclusive, an Into the Impossible exclusive. Yeah, yeah. I haven't talked about it much because I'm like, it's mostly written, but I uh -huh. still deliver it to you. And also, it's, it's hard to write a book about a theory that's a work in progress. So there's a lot of like... What is it? I'm not perfect. Don't ask the string theorists. Uh, they, they would disagree with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, right? But but I, I think part of the thing that I'm interested in is um, is how hard it is to work at the frontier and, and the fact that we're not doing that alone, mm -hmm. right? You, you can't, especially nowadays, you can't really work on the frontier of knowledge without interacting with other people. And I think the alien conversation is particularly interesting because it's one that I, since all of us are the phenomena of life, all of us should be able to engage in in this problem, right? Like all of us have an intimate connection to the physics we're trying to understand, and everyone has a clue. It's just like how do we stitch all those clues together to figure out what we are? Right, right, exactly. Well, Sarah, this has been uh, so much fun. I can't wait for that book to come out. You'll have to come back on the show when it is out. Uh, this has been a, just a fascinating conversation. Uh, with a deep thinker and I'm so glad that you share your ideas with with not only with me but with the universe the multiverse of minds that you've connected to and uh, especially with me and my audience today thank you Sarah so much yeah thanks thanks for having me <laughs> any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic <laughs>